If you're listening to this podcast, it's probably because a child you love and care for is differently wired. Are they also struggling in their current educational setting, seen only for what they're doing wrong while longing for positive relationships with peers and others? Envision a world where your child's unique abilities are not just recognized, but celebrated. A world where they can connect with others and their true potential is seen and appreciated. The Strength-Based Assessment Lab's mission is to build a world for your child just like that. Through its innovative approach, it aims to empower students, families, educators, and professionals to create positive, effective, and collaborative learning experiences. Be a part of shaping a brighter future for your child. Visit www.bgs.edu to learn more about what a strength-based assessment could mean for your family. That's bgs.edu. It took me actually stepping back, doing less, you know, finding those moments in your children's development where you foster their own independence, where they find, you know, their power to navigate within instead of using you to do it. It's a challenge I know for all parents, but particularly for my relationship with Ryan. Welcome to the Tilt Parenting Podcast, a podcast featuring interviews and conversations aimed at inspiring, informing, and supporting parents raising differently wired kids. I'm your host, Debbie Reber, and today I'm talking with Julie Lieberman Neal, a life and leadership coach, the founder of the Mother's Quest podcast and community, and the mother of two differently wired boys. I brought Julie onto the show as part of my desire to share the voices and experiences of more parents in the trenches with the podcast. I appreciated Julie's openness in talking about how the ways her journey with her sons, especially her older son, Ryan, who's now 13, have challenged her and ultimately shaped who she is as a woman who's now looking to step into her life more fully, to live what she calls an epic life, and to support and encourage other mothers in doing the same thing. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And before I get to the episode, did you know that some of the production costs for the podcast are being offset by generous donations from listeners like you? My goal is to eventually outsource all the post-production for the show. If you'd like to help us reach our goal, please consider supporting us through our Patreon campaign. Patreon is a simple membership platform that allows listeners like you to make a small monthly contribution to fund our efforts. If you want to help us, visit patreon.com slash parenting. And now I'll get on with the show. Hey, Julie, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Debbie. I'm so excited to be having this conversation with you. I know, me too. We have talked about this, I don't know, I feel like almost a year ago when we first connected through Jonathan Fields. And it's been really exciting for me and cool to watch your podcast grow. And we'll talk about that a little later. But we also have some similarities in our youngins, too. So I'm happy to share your story with our listeners. Yeah, and I I really appreciate how we have been connected over this last year and the ways in which we've supported one another. Without having met and having (laughs) one phone conversation. But yes, I do feel like you are part of my circle. Yeah, and just, well, I may share this later in the conversation, but your podcast and the conversations that you have with Asher have been pretty instrumental for my son, Ryan, in in some of the things we've been moving through this year. So, so grateful that I did find you. Oh, that's so awesome to hear. I get emails from time to time specifically talking about that and a parent saying their child kind of heard themselves for the first time or felt like someone got them. And he just kind of, he, you know, he'll look up from his Kindle and he'll listen and then he'll be like, that's cool. And he beams <laughs> and then he goes back to his book and he moves on. But I know that it, it makes him feel good that he's making a difference in that way. That's awesome. What I would love to start with, we have so many things that we could talk about. And I think this conversation is going to go in many different places. But would you mind just telling us a little bit about yourself, who you are, maybe tell us a little bit about your family makeup and where you live, you know, what you do, just so we know who you are. So I am, you know, first and foremost, I identify these days as being a mom to two boys. My podcast intro, I say to two high energy boys, and they are both full of life and challenge me all the time, I feel like, to be growing into my best self. I have an older son, Ryan, who's 13, and my little guy is four and a half, Jacob. 
And they are both differently wired in different ways. And it's been an amazing experience being their parent and figuring out how to help them thrive. In addition to that, I'm a life and leadership coach. I have 20 years experience in youth development and education and community building. And about a decade ago, I got training to be a coach. And in the last year, I have created my own venture called Mother's Quest, which I know we may talk more about later, which is really about helping mothers like myself live what I call our epic lives and find the ways in which in doing so, we actually inspire our children to be able to do the same. Hmm. And I do want to talk about Mother's Quest and about your vision that you're trying to encourage people to live epic lives. And I know that was part of your own personal quest. That's how it all began. Were your children and, and specifically maybe what was going on with Ryan and discovering that he was a differently wired person, was that part of your journey to want to create and, and kind of figure out how to inspire your kids? I mean, how I guess what I'm asking is how tied up in your children's wiring was your own personal journey and going down this path? It's interesting. It's I think it's it's probably complicated. There are many ways in which I think that what I have gone through in terms of really stepping up and being a champion have helped me see myself and the, the power that's in me um, in ways I'm not sure I would have otherwise. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure I would have, you know, at some point said, I want to, I want my life to be epic. But in being Ryan's mom, I've found those qualities in myself called out. So in some ways, I'm on this quest because of my motherhood journey. In other ways, I feel like what I had to do in terms of how I was focusing on my child pulled me away maybe from figuring out my life passion and purpose. And in the last year or so, there's been this realization that I don't have to choose Hmm that actually I can become a stronger mother and parent when I'm also making space for myself and my own growth and learning and my own passions and pursuing the the biggest version of myself and my life that I can. I love hearing how it all kind of merges together. I think in some ways, Ryan's 13, Asher's going to be 13 this summer. And yes, we still need to get them together for a Skype play date, which I think could be epic in its own way. But um <laughs> You know, I think there's something that happens often for parents who have kids our children's age, and it starts to like all come together. I think when you're in those earlier years, it can be very confusing, we can feel super lost. I had some major identity crises as I was like, trying to figure out how do I have my own life and I'm so involved in this person's life and, I, and I'm and i having right. to play this role of advocate that I don't really want to play and it's taking up way more time than I want. And, you know, I think there was a lot of just internal conflict for me in trying to to figure out how to even live my life. Like who am I from day to day or hour, hour by hour, minute to minute? If you can go back in the time capsule a bit, did you have a similar experience when you were kind of in the the throes of those hard years. Absolutely. And you know, what's really interesting is that, you know, with my four and a half year old, we're just now getting clear about some of his needs and realizing that we need to step up in an advocacy role and, you know, really give him the support he needs to thrive. And I've wondered if that means, oh, maybe now I have to put all of these other things on the back burner. And I think it's not the case. I I do think that even when your child is younger and the needs are greater, it's more about my awareness level now. And, you know, I've already learned some lessons from my first experience with Ryan. So absolutely, um, I could share a little bit about, you know, our story with him. We were one of those people that was extremely fortunate that we flagged that there were you know, significant developmental delays and issues happening for Ryan when he was 18 months old. So even before he was two, we were able to get intensive intervention for him. And I was one of those people at the time that I had, from my work experience, I had tremendous research skills and ability to connect. 
And so I just jumped all in, found out who I needed to know. And, you know, within a month or two, we had a very comprehensive plan for him. You know, working with an OT and a speech therapist and behavioral therapy, we also chose because it was really aligned with my own personal experience to pursue a biomedical approach to treating him and changed his diet, found out he was deficient in certain things and um, started to supplement for those things, took a trip to this intensive family immersion program that was instrumental. So Ryan was able to get a lot of help, but I do remember in the, you know, in the first few weeks of realizing that there was something significantly, you know, atypical about his development, I was definitely in some deep despair, full of fear, and I had this feeling, and I don't know if anybody else has had it quite this way, of feeling like whatever was happening to him was actually happening to me. Like all of a sudden, my life was totally changed. And I think there is this way in which we can become totally enmeshed in our children and their life experience. Yeah and forget that they are their own people, they have their own journey, and we have a role to play, but we are not actually them. So that is something I've been kind of learning in different ways over and over again in my motherhood journey. But the first thing I had to do was be able to kind of separate myself a little bit from him and what he was experiencing. How did you do that? Because, you know, this idea of enmeshment, it's something I've been writing about recently. And I think especially when they're younger, it's really difficult because they aren't as much their own person yet, right? You, we don't really know who they are. It's hard to imagine how they're going to be in the world. We feel so completely responsible for every aspect of them, right? So yeah. how did you find that distance? Well, I think it has been, you know, a, a dance um, all of these years of kind of coming in and out of it. In the very earliest days when I was the most worried, it was as simple as having somebody watch Ryan and going out to dinner with my husband Hmm. and just realizing that I was still capable of, you know, conversation and joy and having an experience where he wasn't present with me. Mm -hmm. I think the self-care is really important in some ways, being able to learn from and model from my husband, who this, this may be a stereotype, but my experience has been that he has the ability to have more distance than I do as the mom. Mm -hmm. And he has been able to hold some perspective that maybe I couldn't see right away that was extremely helpful. So one of the things that happened early on that definitely helped me on our, on my path to just feeling healthier and being able to be more proactive is that my husband said, you know, we don't, know what the future holds for Ryan. Because when he was that young, you know, we had our, the psychologist that worked with us said, you know, I think he's going to talk someday. You know, so we went from thinking we had this completely typically developing healthy child, baby, toddler who, who was very joyful and was a pretty easy baby to all of a sudden completely fearing for his future and really not knowing and hoping that he would become verbal was what we were told. And so there was this, you know, having to let go of the fixed expectations that we were holding for our child, which I think every parent has to do in some way. But Mm -hmm. for us, it was, you know, so much, you know, so much of a stronger thing that was right in front of us. And my husband was able to say, we don't know what the future holds, but what we do know and what we can focus on is how can we help Ryan just become the best Ryan he can be. And every, every time I say this, I get teary. And it really is true. Like once I was able to, to let go of all my fixed expectation and focus on, oh, yeah, that's right. What do I need to do to just help him live his fullest potential? And realize at the end of the day, that's what's true for all of us. Mm-hmm. Then I could get out of focusing on the future which is, I think, where a lot of the fear lay, and just getting more present and, you know, enjoying, you know, all of the great qualities that he had already, and then working on, okay, where do we need to get support to help him grow? I love the way you phrase that to help him be the best Ryan he could be. I mean, just hearing that, I know that so many listeners will be like, yeah, like that is that is really all that matters at the end of the day. That's the only thing that we can do. We really can't control anything other than how we show up 
to this relationship and the dynamic. And I really like that. Darren and I are prepping for a big move at the moment. So we are fully leaning into any and everything that simplifies things. And that absolutely includes mealtimes. At a time when my executive functioning skills are being pushed to the limit, even planning and executing dinner for our family these days can feel like a really big lift. That's why I'm especially grateful for Green Chef, a meal service that offers pre-measured and prepped ingredients to my door. Each box is packed with foods you can feel good about, like whole fruits and vegetables, plus lean protein and whole grain options. In fact, one of the things I love most about Green Chef is that they offer options that prioritize gut and brain health, with science-backed recipes that feature ingredients like fiber, antioxidants, and omega-3 fatty acids. During this time of lots of stress, it feels really grounding to know we're supporting ourselves nutritionally. I will take all the support I can get. And Green Chef doesn't just cover dinner recipes. I can add high quality breakfasts, lunches, and snacks to my weekly box from Green Market. Green Chef has a special offer for Tilt listeners. Go to greenchef.com slash tilt50 and use code tilt50 to get 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's 50% off plus 20% off your next two months when you use the code tilt50 at greenchef.com slash tilt50. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. Maybe I've watched too many seasons of The Amazing Race, but every time I have to go somewhere on the subway, I treat it like a competition. It's all about making the right gut decisions about which route will get me there the fastest. Sometimes those decisions get me where I'm going early, and other times my gambles don't really pay off. Probiotics can't help with most gut decisions, but if your gut needs a little support, Ritual has your back. Their Symbiotic Plus, a three-in-one supplement, has clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic to support a balanced gut microbiome. I've been using Symbiotic Plus for about six months now, and it's become a core part of my morning routine. I take the mini capsule every morning while making my way through my inbox, whether I'm at home or I'm on the road, because it doesn't need to be refrigerated. And the capsule itself is delayed released, which helps it survive the harsh conditions of the upper GI tract for delivery to the colon. And that's exactly where we want it to go. Ritual invested in a study modeling the human colon, which showed that Symbiotic Plus significantly increased microbial diversity and the growth of beneficial bacteria. There's no more shame in your gut game. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. Get 25% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash tilt. Start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash tilt for 25% off. So what did that then allow for, for Ryan? You know, when you were able to to really kind of reframe in that way and not let your fear take over. I mean, my hunch is it still cropped up from time to time, <laughs> maybe still does, but Definitely. but what did that give you the ability to do then in terms of how you were supporting Ryan? Well, what's interesting is, you know, there's so much information now and I know you did a show about it, about a growth mindset, but I think what that enabled us to do from the very from very early on was to honor who he was as a whole person and all of his gifts and strengths, which he even had at that young age, and then identify areas that were challenging, but not look at it through the lens of like, of this is a real problem, mm-hmm. but more this is an opportunity for growth. And what we've tried to do ourselves as parents is be very open and honest about all the ways in which we're on our own journey too to become our best selves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we will talk openly about our strengths, but also the things that are really hard for us that we're still working on even as adults. So I think that, again, that mindset and perspective has been helpful You know, he grew up always knowing what were the things that he was working on. You know, it it wasn't a surprise. He he knew that he was in therapy. He knew that we were helping him, you know, with some of his social skills. He knew that when he was younger that he had, you know, some sensory issues that he worked through. But we never focused on any labels. We just kind of treated it as his life experience. Mm -hmm. We didn't make it seem like it was some unusual thing or something that we didn't call out that these were things that weren't true for other kids. 
I'm just curious about his school experience. Did he have struggles in school? Like what was his personal experience through the elementary years? We're very fortunate on the whole and that I wouldn't say that we've had very difficult school experiences. I think his experience until fourth grade had some some positives, but there were definitely challenges. There were relationship issues with kids at school that were challenging for him. He had some fantastic teachers, but in general, you know, one of the ways in which he's differently wired is he's also highly gifted. So, you know, he he was always questioning. He's one of those kids that really enjoys being in the limelight and answering questions and sharing his thoughts, but didn't always pick up on the, up on the cues when maybe he was sharing a little bit too much or it was time to give space for other kids. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there was, I think, sometimes some frustration from teachers, definitely some issues on the playground. And in general, he wasn't being challenged to his fullest capacity. So things really changed for him in an incredibly positive way when our district has a special um, gifted and talented education program that you can move into for fourth and fifth grade that you have to take a test. And he was able to change schools and move into that program where all of a sudden he was surrounded by peers who were more of a match for him in terms of their interests and their intellectual abilities. And there were teachers who really understood him. So I would say since since that period, he's really been able to thrive more in his educational environment, too. That's so good to hear. And it's not something I hear so often from guests or from people who are, you know, a part of the Tilt community. So I, I'm happy that you have found a good match. And, and he's in middle school now, right? He is. Has that yeah, been going well? Grade. It's gone really well. Again, we were really blessed in that. So that same program that started in fourth and fifth grade, there's a continuation of it for middle school. So it, almost his entire cohort moved over with him to middle school. Um, he's in a STEM middle school and half of his classes are you know, with the kids in the GATE program. And half of his classes are with the kids from PE and his electives are with the other students from the school. So he has the experience of interacting you know, with diverse group of peers. And it's been really great for him. Oh, that's awesome. And so you talked a little bit about the way that you raised him in terms of not using labels and really just being open in the family, you know, that we're all working on things. And this is just part of who you are and things that you're working on, which I love that approach. What has your journey been like in terms of talking about differences diagnoses? Is that something that you've had conversations about? And and how does Ryan feel about it, if you don't mind sharing, as much as you're comfortable sharing? Yeah. So um, I had a conversation with Ryan today before the before the interview to, to check in with him about, okay, you know, what would you like me to share? And he said, Mom, you should really share anything you need to share to help the community. Uh, at the same time, we both right now are on the same page about the fact that the actual label and diagnosis that he was given when he was younger isn't something that we're openly sharing about, but all the other details about it, we are. And what has also shifted for Ryan recently is about a month or two ago, we actually shared the actual, the diagnosis with him that he was given when he was a child. And that was something, again, you know, he knew all of the details about it, but he didn't know the actual diagnosis. When I told him about it, he said, oh, it's like Jeopardy. I knew the answer, but I didn't know the question. (laughs) A great oh, Ryan, <laughs> Ryan kind of analogy. So true. So what happened there is, you know, for the longest time, I did not want the label to define his identity. But I also knew that at some point we would share it with him. And a couple months, it was actually before his bar mitzvah, which ended up being a very transformative rite of passage experience on many levels for him. He had come home from school one day upset about something that happened at school with a friend and, you know, was was really upset with himself because he just didn't understand why this friend was upset by something he had done. And then he didn't understand why that was so hard for him because I was able to point out to him, oh, I can see how he felt this way. And I just could tell in the moment, I just instinctively knew it was the right time to tell him Hmm. and to let him know that, you know, this is why some of these things are harder for him. and. I had listened to your episode with Asher and you and I have had this conversation. And so it was also in the back of my mind. I think Ryan even had heard an episode with Asher, maybe around the growth mindset. 
And so I also framed it in a very positive way too about, you know, some of the things that are gifts for him because of his life experience and the things that come with the diagnosis. And he instantly felt relief. He just could tell that it was like a piece of the puzzle coming together. My husband and I don't necessarily think that he would meet the criteria for the diagnosis or that it really accurately matches him anymore. And so Mm -hmm. I said, this is what you were diagnosed with. And I think that some of these things are still challenging for you. In the same way that like if you were in a car accident and you recovered from that accident, you know, your shoulder, it might be a little bit harder for you to walk still on that leg that was injured. But Ryan has chosen to hold it differently. And he really, in some ways, has embraced it, not in a way that's allowing him to let himself off the hook for the places where he needs to grow. But it really just seems to have given him just a broader understanding and some more compassion for himself. That has been very helpful. And shortly after, we did then listen to your episode with Asher about labels and diagnosis. And I think, you know, hearing Asher talk about how, you know, hearing that confidence in Asher and about what a gift it is also helped solidify that for Ryan. And so he's, he's been talking a lot about, he he doesn't lack in confidence either. (laughs) So he's been talking about his exceptional gift and how he wouldn't want to let go of those things. That's so awesome. I love that you said him feeling compassion for himself. And I think that is so important. And yeah, I appreciate that. And it's really, I think that's one of the cool things about when kids are older too, right? I think it can be trickier when kids are quite young. I mean, we we told Asher what was going on with him when he was eight. And he did feel even still like, oh, yeah, okay. I mean, I think he said in the episode, yep, makes sense. I got it. (laughs) But there is something that's really cool as they get older and they can become really invested in what's happening with them and curious about their own growth. And I mean, my thinking is that these kids are going to be kind of the most emotionally evolved adults because they've done so much work on themselves. They really understand their strengths and their weaknesses. And they have worked so hard on figuring out who other people are because it's they've had to do that work. So I think it's, exactly. a, it's a gift. Yeah, if I could say a little bit more about his bar mitzvah, because um, I think there were a couple of things that happened that were remarkable. Because this had been sort of filtering in just before his bar mitzvah, where he was going to be, you know, standing in front of his family and friends, and in many ways, stepping into a more adult version of himself. He chose in his um, Devar Torah, which is like the commentary on his portion, to connect it to what he had learned about himself. And so, again, without using the actual diagnosis, he shared about his history and the things that have been challenging for him and how, you know, many kids that have had the same, you know, issues have not been able to thrive the way he has and how he realizes what a gift that is. Um, and that he has to really, that he has responsibility to do something with that gift and how in many ways for him, he was not a believer in, in a God, but that this experience of coming to know his full history has helped him be more in touch with some higher power that mm. he feels has helped him, you know, be who he is today. So, you know, hearing him and most of his friends don't, didn't know anything about his childhood history. They might have had, you know, some puzzle pieces coming together of, oh, yeah. that's why this is a little hard. For, those things are hard for you. Yeah. But, you know, it took a lot of courage and a tremendous amount of self-awareness and emotional intelligence to be able to do that in the way that he did it. That's so cool. Yeah, I listened to your podcast uh, episode where you you had Ryan on and I just loved that conversation so much. And listeners, I'll leave a link in the show notes because it's a really a beautiful conversation. And I mean, he sounds like from the conversation, what I heard, just a really thoughtful, insightful, lovely, kind human being. And you could just tell that he likes who he is. And it really came through that growth that you're describing. That's so cool. Thank you. And, you know, just to quickly touch upon the criteria of certain diagnoses. I think that's one of the really challenging things about differently wired kids in general, especially kids that have dual or, you know, or more diagnoses, is it's really hard to know what's what. 
you know, Asher was first given his provisional diagnosis when he was five, and then his second assessment when he was eight. And now at nearly 13, like, We have conversations about it and we'll read books about, you know, and he'll say, well, this looks like me. This does not look like me. He's like, and I do not have a problem with this. But this, yes, I totally get that. So it's it's just kind of interesting. I don't think any of this is black and white. I think the labels can be helpful for just kind of having a direction, right, to... Knowing which door to walk through to get help. Exactly. But it it certainly is something that can be fluid. It can be very confusing. I think the more layers that there are, more pieces of the puzzle to fit together. Absolutely. And that's what we're in in the midst of exactly right now for our younger guy. And it's helpful that I've had some more, more life experience through Ryan, but I could see you know, I think that there may be some signs of that giftedness going on. I can see the sensory issues at play. You know, Mm -hmm. maybe there is some other more clinical diagnosis of ADHD or not. You know, it's really hard to say. At the end of the day, I think it only really matters in that it helps you know how to move forward again, just to help your child, you know, move into their fullest potential. But there's no one right answer necessarily for so many of these things. They're behavioral diagnoses and it's not like a blood test. You know, you don't find out with 100% certainty that that's what it is. And it can be so confusing. Hey there, it's Debbie. I love making this show and sharing conversations about how to support our awesome neurodivergent kids. I've seen how even one little insight from an interview can spark a big shift in daily life. But I know that raising complex kids can be messy and lonely. And just when we think we figured it out, something comes up that boots us right back to feeling overwhelmed and stuck. That's why I've poured everything into creating a way for parents like us navigating complex parenting journeys to join together and chart a path that feels positive, hopeful, and doable. It's the brand new Differently Wired Club experience. In the club, you'll get personal support from me and other seasoned parent coaches, six live calls every month where you can connect and get your personal questions answered, the opportunity to learn directly from authors and experts like I have on this show, monthly themes for getting specific and tactical, an exclusive private podcast feed, and the best, most generous community of parents. Seriously, these folks show up for themselves and each other, and that right there is really everything. Because it's a daily reminder that we're not alone. Our kids aren't broken, and we have totally got this. The recently rebooted Differently Wired Club is on a brand new platform with its very own iOS and Android app. It is such a great space. However you learn, whatever your style, no matter the ages, genders, and neurodivergent profile of your children, the Differently Wired Club can help you cultivate the positive shifts you're hoping for. Join us today by going to tiltparenting.com slash club. That's tiltparenting.com slash club. I hope to see you on the inside. Are you overwhelmed by the things that get in the way of you doing what you want to do? Are you looking for ways to simplify life to better align with your values? Do you want to create space in your schedule so you have room for more of the good stuff? Play, joy, relationships, gratitude, and more? If you answered yes to any of these questions, I invite you to check out Edit Your Life, a podcast to help you edit the unnecessary from your life so you have more room to enjoy the awesome. Through episodes with me, Christine Co, and a range of super smart, compassionate, and thoughtful guests, you'll come away with big picture insights and practical ways to declutter your home, schedule, and mental space without getting bogged down by perfection. I have always believed that small moments and actions matter tremendously. My goal is to help you find agency and space in your life through doable baby steps that will leave you feeling accomplished instead of overwhelmed. Check out Edit Your Life wherever you enjoy your podcasts. So I'm curious to know a little bit more about your personal experience. You know, I listened to you talk and you you seem to be in such a kind of clear place and certainly have really worked hard over the years to show up fully for, for Ryan and for your younger son and just being present and being a mama bear in a compassionate, loving way and all those things. I'm curious to know what are things that still kind of trigger you? I think that same issue that I raised earlier about like the enmeshment, um, you know, having to figuring out when and how to pull myself apart 
you know, we were talking before we started recording about, you know, this program that we just returned from in Portland, which is called Pace Place. And I'll send you a link because there, there may be listeners that would be interested in learning about it. One of the most helpful things we've done for Ryan over the years and now for Jacob too. But one of the things they observe and would help me with is the degree to which I would step in and sort of like co co-regulate was the word they used for Ryan as if like I'm as if we are one person and that he can sort of use me um, in that way instead of realizing he has to figure it out on his own. So for instance, you, I know you know this from listening to our podcast episode that Ryan is afraid of animals. So one of the things that the therapist did at, at Pace Place was to bring his dog yesterday. And, you know, even just being in the presence of a dog that's off a leash or running around was really freaking Ryan out. And I would go straight to like, you know, let's do this together. And I also like over rationalize or just, you know, stay in a cognitive place with it of trying to explain everything Mm -hmm. um, instead of remembering that it's an emotional experience and that Ryan really has to find his own way. Mm. So, you know, we were upstairs and the dog was with us and Ryan was downstairs, but didn't want to come up because the dog was there and he was, you know, calling me and, and sounding younger and younger, you know, like starting to call me mommy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, who is that child? And my reaction would have been to like, maybe like, go get him and help him come up. And, you know, Eric, who we were working with was saying like, no, 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 just he knows you're here. You say, I'm here. I'm up here. But don't like get entangled in it and let him have his own experience. He has, he has to find it in himself to be able to move through this. You can't do it for him. And sure enough, the more I actually got quiet and got less involved, the more Ryan was able to kind of calm down. And he ended up coming up and, you know, being in the presence of the dog. And sure, they weren't like rolling around together, but he was able to tolerate it in a way that he wasn't when he was at that heightened level of distress. And it took me actually stepping back, doing less, you know, finding those moments in your children's development where, you foster their own independence, where they find, you know, their power to navigate within instead of using you to do it. It's a challenge I know for all parents, but particularly for my relationship with Ryan. Yeah. And it makes me wonder too, just hearing you say that, you know, you were your energy, I imagine when you were concerned about Ryan's response to the dog and, you know, wanting to be engaged in that that he feeds off of that energy as well, even if you're not in the same room, you know? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's complicated. It's complicated. And I think it is letting go. And I think as they get older too, and maybe this is, maybe I'm projecting onto you because I've been feeling a little weepy (laughs) about Asher almost turning 13 and having a lot of moments of like, oh my God, you know? Yeah. You are growing up and it is, it's kind of heartbreaking. So there's a separation that's happening because of age as well. That has to happen. Yeah, it's the natural progression. Yes, it's what should be. Interesting. Well, listen, I would love actually if we could switch gears and talk a little bit about Mother's Quest because it's such a personal project for you. And I know that it's really a passion for you and you have a big mission for what you want to do and how you want to support other women. So would you tell us a little bit about what Mother's Quest is and what your inspiration was for creating it? Absolutely. Well, I really think about Mother's Quest as a community and a movement to help mothers in the years when we're raising our children live what I call our epic lives. And that's, you know, where we really, where we realize that we're the hero of our life journey and that we move into action to fill our lives with the things that matter most. And so EPIC, you know, has that connotation of the heroic journey, but it also is an acronym mnemonic for what I have found are the guideposts in the years when I'm raising my children, that if these things are showing up, I think I'm going to live a more EPIC life. So E stands for engaged, and that's being engaged mindfully with my children. P is the passionate and purposeful difference that I want to make that's beyond my family. I is invested in myself and C is connected to a strong support network so that I'm in community on my journey. And I, you know, as a coach, 
I can see the power of um, making time for self-reflection, for identifying what you really want, you know, creating space for figuring out what's in your way, what's feeling hard. And so I want to, through Mother's Quest, create coaching programs and reflection circles where mothers can come together in community and provide that for one another. I've decided that I'm on this epic journey myself and I don't want to do it alone. So, you know, part of this is I've, I've created it to meet my own needs of, you know, what do I feel like I want as I'm on the journey? Uh, the podcast, which I know you've listened to, which is the first component of Mother's Quest that I've rolled out fully, was one of those ways that I could get the support I was looking for. So I reach out to mothers on their own quest that I feel like I have something to learn from. And we talk about these epic guideposts and they give me a challenge that, you know, other listeners can also take as well. And these challenges have already been, you know, making my life more epic. And there's also a Facebook group where I have found we can encourage conversation among one another, but I also can share really deeply personal posts. So just even having people to witness my own journey and a place to share has been so helpful for me. And it is so personal. I mean, I've listened to a number of your podcasts and you really go there. You're very open and your guests really go there. You ask really deep questions. So I really love that. I feel like you are sharing yourself with people and it feels very, um, I don't know what the word is. It feels accessible and familiar and warm and comforting, you know, like Mm. what was it that really said, I need to do this, right? Because you're, you've created this whole movement around wanting to live more fully in your life. Like what was it that you reached a point and you said, I have to do this. This is my next step. Well, I think some of it is what we were talking about earlier about um, that. I think I was through my experience of being a mom, which has been so transformational that I've just like seen parts of myself that I never knew were there. So the idea of, of my actual voice being on a podcast or, you know, sharing something so personal in a public way is not something I've ever done before in my life. I was always, I'm the youngest of three girls. I was always the quiet one. You know, in my my previous career, I was a fund development director, and it was all about supporting somebody else's vision and work. So, um, but there was something about what motherhood has called out in me that I could just I could just instinctively tell there was like a next frontier for me that was about me being more visible and really going for it in a bigger way in my life. I think um, I love coaching. I love being part of helping other people transform. So as much as this is all, you know, for me as part of my quest, I also really want to create the community and the space to help other mothers create the same kind of life for themselves that I'm moving toward. And there were also, there was also that experience of those years where my focus was so much on my children and on Ryan that I think I had these whispers of things I wanted to do that were brewing for a while and I wasn't listening to them. Mm -hmm. And I think that so much of the conversation in our culture around motherhood is that like you can either have a career and do passionate, purposeful work, or you can be a really present mother, but there aren't a lot of conversations about how you can do those two things. And even more so how, when you do both of those, they actually reinforce and strengthen one another. So a lot of the things I share in the podcast episodes and in my Facebook group are all of the ways in which my kids will say something to me or an experience I have with my children strengthens what I bring to Mother's Quest or something that's happened for me in a podcast episode or in a coaching session, I then can bring to my children in a different way. And then I did have, I don't know if you read my blog post, I had this very spiritual experience one day where two birds got trapped in my home. And, you know, I just, I chose to stop and reflect on what the meaning of that could be for me and decided it meant, you know, I, I, what I had to do was open the door to let these birds out that were crashing into the glass. And I just realized it was as simple as that. I had to just choose yeah. and open the door. And at first I thought it was that other people had to open the door for me. And then I realized there was a second bird in the house. And when that second bird left, I realized, oh, there's another meaning here. If I don't open the door and walk through it myself first, nobody can do it for me. Mm. No, I haven't read that, but I will check it out. That's awesome. 
I love it when, you know, these different pieces of who we are stop competing and we can start feeling like it is all one big, beautiful mess, you know, and all the pieces support and inform everything else. And there isn't this constant tugging, you know, back and forth. It's so great to hear. Yeah, I know. I really, I've been loving just this idea that, and I, I, somebody said it to me this morning about there's no wrong path. You know, you just might take, you might need to be rerouted. And she used this analogy of a, of like a video game where you might realize, oh, you actually have to go get that, you know, the green, you know, super pack, like, you know, like there's some lesson or some experience that you might need on a different road that you weren't expecting but it's all part of the same, the same game, the same journey. Yep. So true. Well, listen, I want to just thank you for coming on the show and just sharing your story. It's super inspiring. I know for me, and I know that a lot of listeners are going to be inspired and just the way that you've walked down this path and really worked hard to let go and and honor and respect the journeys that your kids are on. I mean, I think that's the best we can all do. So thank you for for sharing that with us today. It was so fantastic to be able to have this conversation with you. And I also just want to honor and thank you for the work that you're doing with Tilt. It's so important, you know, this positive mindset, bringing to light these conversations, you know, even about, you know, whether or not to share the diagnosis and how you look at the labels. They're conversations that I have not experienced anywhere else. And I noticed as we started being a little bit, you know, concerned about our younger son, I've been diving back into, you know, the Tilt podcast episodes. And it's just an incredible resource for parents like myself. So thank you. And thank you to Asher, too, for creating this for us. Oh, thank you so much. I will pass that along to him. You've been listening to the Tilt Parenting Podcast. For the show notes for this episode, including links to Julie's podcast and Mother's Quest community, as well as all the other resources we talked about, visit tiltparenting.com slash session 75. And a quick invitation to try our free Differently Wired 7-Day Challenge. When you sign up, I'll email you a short inspirational video every day for one week with the tip you can incorporate into your life right away to shift your experience. You'll also be invited to join a private Facebook group for people who've gone through or are currently doing the challenge. More than 700 people have already gone through the challenge. It's free, it's ongoing, and it's designed to help you find more peace and confidence in your parenting journey today. To join, visit tillparenting.com slash seven day. If you like what you heard on today's episode, please consider subscribing or leaving us a review in iTunes. Both things help our podcast get noticed in the crowded podcast space. Thanks again for listening. For more information on Tilt Parenting, visit www.tiltparenting.com. Hey, are you a parent of a teenager? Are you feeling overwhelmed about how to be what they need while also holding limits and boundaries that keep them safe? Are you tired of conversations that negate how messy this season of parenting is? Well, I've got you. My name is Casey O'Rourke. I am a positive discipline trainer, parent coach, and the host of the Joyful Courage podcast. Every week I come to you with an interview, digging into tough topics with experts I trust and solo shows that go deep into the personal growth and mindset needed to raise teens in a way that grows them into confident, capable young people. I am not afraid of getting real about the intersection of conscious parenting and the teen years, while also bringing in vulnerability, humor, and lightness. I'm walking the path with you and honored to serve. Listen to Joyful Courage on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you consume podcasts.